Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Family Sedan channel. Attorney Jeremy Hogan has now publicly stated what he believes the odds are for various outcomes in the SEC v. Ripple case. I'm sure a lot of you have already seen uh, what he had to say in his latest uh, video on his very popular uh, YouTube channel, Legal Briefs. And I, I want to share with you some of the stuff that he had to say and just some of my own comments along with it. I'm not going to rehash his entire video, but um, I did take some notes along the way as I was watching because there's a few things that I, I thought was wor worth a discussion in a, a, a video on the Moon Family Sedan channel. Uh, so I did print up something here. Um, but I also wanted to say I'm a bit disappointed and I know that pretty much everybody that is aware of what I'm about to say is also feeling the same thing. Um, attorney Jeremy Hogan in this most recent video announced that that is his last video for the YouTube channel Legal Briefs. He is he has no intentions currently to move forward with it. And the rationale I understand, I, you know, he, he stated you know, these are the last legal briefs in the SEC v. Ripple case and his channel, you know, once it took off dramatically and deservedly so, um, when he started covering the SEC v. Ripple case, you know, he just uh, kind of recognized that there would be some sort of finality to that portion. And so I had never asked him what his intentions were after, you know, this type of coverage would end, because inevitably there would be some sort of conclusion to the SEC v. Ripple case. But I had always just privately thought that, or hope, well, both thought and hoped that he would proceed with additional content, something even if we're just in the general crypto space, or who knows? I mean, if crazy stuff happens and, you know, there's an appeal and maybe there's a lot more to cover there. So who knows, maybe he'd keep the, the door open technically, but what he publicly stated in his most recent video is that it is his last video, which is very um, regrettable. But I understand at the end of the video, he also talked about how it was really just basically a time vampire, my words, not his, <laughs> because it was um, taking him away on, you know, key times, like on the weekends from, uh, you know, his children, time he could have spent with them. But he felt uh, obligated to uh, to kind of follow this through to the end. So nothing but love and respect and support for attorney Jeremy Hogan. Uh, I don't blame him or fault him. If he wants to stop here, I totally get it. But I hope that he rethinks it, or at least from time to time puts something out. There's still going to be stuff to talk about. I mean, if, if at the, like at the very least, I'm hoping once there's a, some sort of conclusion in this case, like say we do get finality here, I would love for him to just give his perspective and analysis regarding the, um, you know, the what the judge has to say. Like say she, whether she votes in favor of, you know, Ripple's motion for summary judgment or, or the SEC's, and those aren't the only net potential outcomes, but say one of those things happens, I would love to hear his perspective in a, in a legal briefs video, so who knows, but that's where it's at right now. But anyway, I'll go ahead and break this down a little bit further. Before going uh, further, though, I do want to be clear, I do not have a legal or financial background of any kind. I am not offering legal or financial advice, and you definitely should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. I'm just an enthusiast who enjoys making YouTube videos about crypto-related topics, but just as a hobby and just for fun. And I'll tell you, if it weren't for people like Attorney Hogan and, you know, Attorney Deaton, there are some other attorneys within the community have become pretty well known within our community. We would be in the dark when it comes to this stuff. I mean, like, we're all highly competent people. We, we are. Like, we're, we're, we, we know what we're doing here. We're not stupid, right? And we're following what's going on here. But if you don't have a legal background, you're not just going to read the documents that come out and then know what the hell it means. You know, like, I, I would I, honestly, I'd be totally in the dark. And so what I've done is I, I form my own opinion based on the analysis of all sorts of attorneys. And then I like to use my platform to share what I've learned from them. But my gosh, just to be, I mean, I mean, you guys know this already, but I just, I think it's worth saying, especially in light of attorney Hogan saying that's his last video without him and Deaton in particular, my God, <laughs> I don't know where we'd be as a community. Like these two in particular, my gosh, I can't be the, only, I know I'm not the only one that feels that way. But, um, so, um, attorney Hogan in his, his last video, uh, he stated that he does believe that there's a slightly better than 50% chance that Ripple will win this lawsuit, uh, about a 30% chance that the SEC wins, and about a 20% chance that there's a, uh, you know, that, that, that actually we're not going to see the end of the case, not, at least not as it pertains to uh, deciding in favor of the SEC or Ripple in terms of summary judgment, meaning that that last 20% could mean that we end up seeing a jury trial, actually. So that's a third opportunity. And the fourth possibility that he cited in his video is that there could just be like, my words, not his, like a wild card scenario, effectively, where there's some sort of, you know, decision that the judge comes to that nobody has even theorized she might come to. And then he, he put a real small percentage on that. 
And outside of the video, I did, I'll just pull this up right now. Uh, somebody asked him, somebody named the Justin Gilmore asked, is settlement still a possibility? So that would be the fifth possibility. And he said, yes, but time is running out. I think it's only feasible for another month or so. So technically five different potential outcomes there. And, um, and so he, he did state, and this is interesting to me. He stated that, you know, Ripple had no legal obligation uh, to purchasers of XRP after the sale of XRP occurred. So, you know, no post-sale obligations. Though he, you know, he did note that he spoke with other attorneys who think that it's, you know, it's more likely for Ripple to win on this point upon appeal, frankly, because th their rationale, from what he said, their rationale for it is basically because it's too drastic a ruling, uh, you know, it, it might be better suited for an appellate court, which would be higher than, you know, the, the, the circuit that they're now, the district court. And, um, you know, as a result, and I hope that doesn't happen, but it's a possibility, They some, some of them think, um, which means that, you know, you wouldn't see anything unless, you know, there, there's an appeal. So that would mean that Ripple loses, and then, you know, then there's a, at least on that, and then there's an a, appeal. And so Attorney Hogan disagrees, and he thinks that based on Judge Torres' previous rulings, the, the, that that judge actually is the type to be brave enough uh, to, to, you know, to find a ruling, such a ruling in Ripple's favor. So that would be good. And he, he actually shared something that I shared in my video where I was doing my full breakdown of the, uh, of, of Ripple's reply to the SEC's motion for summary judgment. And I absolutely, I really love this one. <laughs> this, I, I love, I love the, um, the entire response from Ripple, but in particular, uh, th this passage, it really struck me. And it's the it's it's one of the only couple that attorney Hogan pointed out. So it turns out it struck him the same way. But but take it out. It's, it's uh, from right here. This is worth repeating. So check this out. Reads as follows. So this is from Ripple. In short, the SEC is asking the court to rewrite the statutes that define its authority. For the SEC to prevail in its opposition, the court would have to endorse the SEC's theory that there can be an investment contract without any contract, without any investor rights and without any issue or obligations. It would have to endorse the SEC's theory that there can be a common enterprise, even if the SEC cannot say what the enterprise is or prove any of the elements that define such enterprises. And it would have to endorse the SEC's theory that purchasers could reasonably have expected profits from Ripple's efforts, even though Ripple never promised to make any efforts, even though it expressly disavowed any obligation to do so, and even though profits were overwhelmingly due not to Ripple's efforts, but to market forces. The court would also have to include that all the Amici that have expressly said they did not join a common enterprise or expect profits from Ripple's efforts are wrong about their own beliefs and actions. The SEC's position boils down to a view that anytime someone buys an asset, hoping to make money, and the seller's interests are even partly aligned with the buyers, it is a security subject to registration. That is not the law, even if the seller uses the sales proceeds to run its business. If Congress wants to expand the securities laws that way, it can do so, but this court should not. Oh, man, that's like a mic drop moment right there as far as I'm concerned. I, to me, as I was reading that, initially my first run through, this, this brief, I was like, that is powerful. It really cuts to the core of just how ridiculous the SEC's assertions are. Um, I also want to highlight this passage, and Attorney Hogan shared this as well. This is from an amicus brief. It's really short. Uh, from Paradigm. Uh, it's an investment firm. And they wrote the following. And this is important because they, I'll actually mention this first. They included as an exhibit to their, um, to their amicus brief, when they were applying to file for amicus brief anyway, they attached this entire document titled the in, uh, Ineluctable, Ineluctable, I think that's how you say it. I forgot. The Ineluctable Modality of Securities. Not a word you use in common like daily parlance, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, the Ineluctable Modality of Securities Law. Why fungible crypto assets are not securities. Now, this document, I think this bitch is like over 150 pages. It's a big bad boy. And it goes down... All of the case law in history having to do with Howie effectively. Like, all of it. It's just spoon-fed to the judge. The judge doesn't have to do the work. It's like, here's everything I need. And here's why it's important. 
So check out this this uh, this this passage from the Amicus brief from Paradigm, and this is what um, Attorney Hogan also shared in his video. And um, I can't remember if I covered this exact part or not in my video, but anyway, because I did a full breakdown of the Paradigm Amicus brief a while back as well. But anyway, the, the relevant portion reads as follows. A comprehensive analysis of federal appellate law reveals that no authority exists to support the SEC's attempt to transmute the Howey analysis of an investment contract transaction into a conclusion about the underlying asset in every, listen to this, in every application of Howey where an investment contract was found, there was some identifiable legal relationship between an ostensible issuer and the investor providing investment capital. So folks, what they're saying here is that if you go back to all of the case all having to do with how back to the beginning of time when this, this all started, when this became legal precedent, there has never been an instance where there's been anyone in the position even remotely similar to Ripple, where the underlying asset was found to be the security when there is no actual contract, when there is there is no legal relationship. And that's in italics, by the way, for those who look on the screen, you can see it. Legal relationship. It doesn't exist. So this would be the first time that such a ruling were made, where there is no legal relationship, but still, because reasons, XRP security. To me, that's powerful. I don't know. I'm not an attorney, but I'm just I'm just using my you know the, the brain I got here. Seems pretty damn logical to me. Uh, attorney Hogan also noted that in the Second Circuit, the binding precedent is set on case law known as the Revit case, which is not precedent, I'll mind you, uh, in the in the First Circuit, which is where Library lost uh, their their case, unfortunately, about a month ago. Uh, and he notes that if the SEC is going to say that Ripple is the common enterprise on which the price of XRP is based, then they better be able to prove that Ripple's efforts directly impact that price. And so the problem, obviously, you know, for them, it's it's just not the case. You know, the price of XRP has always moved in tandem with the entire crypto asset class. So how can they be the common enterprise when their efforts have nothing to do with the price action of XRP, it's kind of a problem, don't you think? So that's something that Attorney Hogan also brought up. And uh, he also stated, you know, uh, there's there's a chance that the judge may find SEC evidence compelling having to do with, you know, uh, you know, close to eight years of Ripple employees and executives talking about XRP price. And that's fine. But he also pointed out, it's like, okay, does that rise to, and I'll have to paraphrase, but it rise to like, the legal standard of whatever you'd actually need to meet for Ripple to actually have been wrong, because like state, stating one thing that might sound bad for Ripple, does it does it rise to the level of okay, this is now actual proof to the legal standard necessary to find that Ripple actually did the things that the SEC is asserting they did? And I, I would I would argue the answer is no. Like I've seen the evidence. There's I've seen the video clips about from Chris Larson, Brad Garlinghouse. I've seen all this stuff that's been said. All, everything from David Schwartz. And I'm just sitting here, I'm like, they, like, they're talking about a brochure that like 100 people received, and there's no proof that it, that resulted in anyone purchasing XRP. And that was back in like, I can't remember if it was 2014 or something like that. It was, a, it was like a lifetime ago in the world of crypto anyway, you know? That was like the beginning of Ripple existing. They cite crap like that. It's like, eh. Now, would a, uh, would a Ripple loss put Ripple out of business? This is another thing Hogan talked about. And his conclusion was, eh, highly, un highly unlikely. And he pointed out something I've been talking about fairly a fair bit lately, which is that Ripple has literally a billion dollars in the bank, as reported by Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse. So they can write a check for pretty much the whole amount. They also still have a bunch of XRP. It's unclear, you know, whether they would or would not be able to continue selling. If they can continue selling, then you know, more money anyway, beyond the billion that they have. And so, and further, by the way, if the judge only finds that sales from 2013 through 2018 constitute an investment contracts, and Ripple would only owe about half that amount. And so uh, Attorney Hogan doesn't think the judge is likely to, you know, split the baby. That's the phrase that we've been using within the community. Attorney Deaton's been using that a lot, you know, uh, meaning that, you, you know, finding that only certain sales of XRP constitute an investment contract. He actually doesn't think that's likely. Um, I, I wish that he did think it were likely. <laughs> but, um, you know, he thinks that Judge Torres was, was just handed too much of a complex mess that it would be too difficult for her to write a well-reasoned judgment as to why some XRP sales would constitute an investment contract while others would not. Because the deal is, if, if they did find, not that I want Ripple to get the shaft here, but I'm just saying, 
if the if the judge found that for you know the first five years or so, okay, the, for for whatever reason she comes up with, those would be illegal securities transactions. But anything from twenty eighteen onward isn't for whatever reasons she comes to. Like that would be good for XRP holders, even though Ripple would have to pay presumably some big ass fine. But in terms of XRP having clarity finally in the United States, that could still occur. But Attorney Hogan doesn't think that's a likely outcome. He thinks it's more, what's most probable is that Ripple just outright wins. So even if it's only a little over 50% chance for that, I'll take it. Because again, SEC winning 30%. And by the way, in that 30% of the SEC winning, he did note that that includes a scenario where they do split the baby. Even though he doesn't think that's necessarily probable, to some degree, okay, it's, it's, it's part of that 30%. Because and, 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 that means that if Ripple loses, we still win here in the XRP community if the baby is split. Because meaning we as XRP holders, because we'll get the clarity surrounding XRP that we desire. So we'd still win even if, if Ripple loses. That's just how it goes. Doesn't mean I want Ripple to lose. I'm just stating facts here. And so, you know, look, the, the judge may not reach a conclusion, um, you know, in, in terms of summary judgment, which means there, there may be a jury trial. And if that happens, the soonest we see a jury trial, according to Jeremy, would be summer of 2023. So I'm just going to hope that doesn't happen. I'd like to see summary judgment in favor of Ripple. That, that's what I want. That just get this whole thing, you know, wrap, that, wrap it up in a nice little bow and put it on the tree for Christmas so we can have a better Christmas than we did December 2020. I'm not a financial advisor. You should not buy or sell anything because of anything I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the Moon Family Sedan. <laughs>